Welcome everyone to Easter Online at Lakeshore. We are so excited to have you with us celebrating our risen King. Yes, we are so excited to be spending this time together with you. You know, we're actually kind of curious who's watching from the greatest distance. Help us with that. Let us know where you're watching from. Say hi uh, to who we have in the chat there along with you to help navigate you through this series and this service. Well, today we're gonna continue in the series that we've been in called, Will the Real Jesus Please Stand Up? And over the last several weeks, we've gotten a chance to learn who Jesus really is. Because if we're called to follow him, we wanna know who actually we are following. We wanna know about his character and his love for us, and it's been a great series. So our senior pastor, Vince DiPaolo, is gonna join us in just a moment and talk about the resurrection. It's been an awesome series and I can't wait to hear the message today. But before we get started, our music team's gonna be out. So if you can, where you are, stand up, let's worship together and let's enjoy the music. Happy Easter Lakeshore. Come on, he is risen, <laughs> amen. Hey, we're so excited that you guys are here today and. You know what, today we are celebrating the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Are you excited to be here? I wanna invite you guys to stand right now. Now we know the scripture says that there is no other name, no other name under heaven in which salvation can be found. And you may or may not believe that, but scripture says it's true, God has declared it as truth. Today commemorates the day that Jesus conquered death that he declared victory over the grave. And you have to understand that you have been bought with a price that he was willing to pay. And he came back to show that he himself is God. He is the name above every name. He is the lamb of God, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. It is by his blood that we have been set free. And today, we commemorate that resurrection. We celebrate our Lord. And we're gonna lift his name, the name above all names, as high as we possibly can.
You know, we sing a song like that, and I just can't help, I just can't help but cry out. Cry out to him, because I know that he is the name above every name. But this Easter, I want to do something a little different. This Easter, I don't want this to be about what we're doing up here, or what's happening out there, or anywhere else in the building. Today is the day we remember our risen Lord, and what he did conquering death. I want this to be a time where it's just you and God. This is just the time that we spend with him just the next few minutes. We're just gonna sing this out to him because I wanna ask this question. If, if everything was stripped away, if it truly was stripped away, would we still worship him? Will we still say he's worthy? Well, let's do that.
nation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. We believe we 
verão You're worthy of it all From you are all things And to you are all things You deserve the glory Yes you do, yes you do You're worthy of it all You're worthy of it all Into you are all things, you deserve the glory. Sing your worthy, cause you're worthy of it all. Yes, you are, you're worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you. Cause you're the name above all names You are worthy of all praise And my heart will sing how great is our God Name above all names Cause you're the name Is 
Can we give him some praise tonight? Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have been bought with a price by your son dying upon a cross, being buried, but Lord, not staying there because the, the grave had no hold on you. You had the final word. Jesus, you came back. And for that, Lord, we worship you. We thank you, almighty Savior. But Lord, we also know that you're coming back again someday. And we wait for you. We praise you. We lift this to you for your glory and your name, the name that is above every name. In the name of Jesus, everyone said, Amen. Come on, one more time, church. What a great song. You know, I, I love when we can come together and worship as one to our one true God and give him all the praises he deserves. Yeah, so do I. And if you just joined us, welcome to Lakeshore Church. We are so glad that you made it today for our Easter service. Thanks for spending part of your weekend with us as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Here at Lakeshore, we understand that God has called us to help people experience God's grace, grow spiritually, connect relationally in groups, and ultimately find how our gifts can impact this world. If this is your first time here or first time in a while, make sure you download our Lakeshore app. Now this is the best way for you to find out what's happening around the church, sign up for anything coming up. You can even watch previous services on demand or even the place where you can find today's message notes. And if this is your first time, make sure you click the connect button at the bottom of the app or go to lcc.info to connect with us and say hi. And let us know where you're joining us from or even to ask questions you might have. We would love to answer all of them for you. And if you've come prepared to worship with your tithes and offerings, this is a great time to do that. There are so many different ways that you can give and we've tried to make it as easy as possible for you. We wanna thank you for your generosity because it's what lets us be here with you today and also connect with people both in Rochester and around the world. It's our goal to share God's love with everyone. And in Lakeshore Kids, we teach your kids about the God who loves them in an exciting, age-appropriate, and safe environment. If you come here and join us live, and you wanna keep your kids with you, the back rows with orange seat covers, those are for you. And we have an area also in the atrium for families with young kids. We wanna create a distraction-free environment in the auditorium, and we know sometimes our little ones, well, they can get uncomfortable. Our guest services team is here to help you make an easy transition from the auditorium. Next week, we're starting our brand new series, Parenting isn't for cowards. Well, because we know that parenting can be overwhelming, especially in the world we live in. And we wanna make sure that we're walking beside you and helping you in every way that we can. That's why we're offering a seminar with a panel discussion and a Q&A session about how to disciple our kids to stand strong in their Christian faith when faced with beliefs, ideologies, and behaviors that undermine the Word of God. This seminar is happening Saturday, April 20th at 9 a.m. You can get more information or register at lcc.info. Once again, we are so excited that you made it today. And to get more information about anything coming up or to find out how you can get connected, make sure you stop by Next Steps in the atrium or just go to lcc.info. Happy Easter, happy Resurrection Saturday slash Sunday. It's all the greatest weekend in the world. What difference does it make? Every day is Easter to me. 
and I hope it is to you. It's the greatest weekend because billions and billions of lives have been changed by what Christ did for those six hours on the cross on Good Friday and what he did on that amazing, very early Sunday morning. He's the reason billions of lives have been changed because of this weekend. And over the past few weeks, we've been looking at Jesus because there are so many misconceptions, faulty views of who Jesus is. So we're, we're out to correct that and change that. And we've looked at his character, how he's 100% God, 100% man. We've looked at his conduct, how Jesus drew people to himself. Then we looked at his chemistry. Not only did he draw people to himself, he changed their lives. He turned them upside down, or they were upside down, and he turned them right side up, really. And then last week, we looked at his chemistry, how we changed lives for the better. And last night, for Good Friday, auditorium was like standing room only, and we looked at his crucifixion, how uh, our, you know, all these different theories on who killed Jesus, and we realized that Jesus voluntarily laid down his life. The Father was pleased to crush him, Isaiah tells us. Really startling information. Now, today, I want to end by looking at his comeback. Is the resurrection of Jesus Christ a hoax or a help? I mean, did Jesus really rise from the dead? Is the resurrection real? Is it a 2,000-year hoax that has just been perpetrated by the church and Christians and culture and whatever? Or is it really a big help for those who believe? That's the question I want to answer today, and it's important because your eternal destiny totally lies not only on the answer, but what you do with the right answer. You know, about 70%, almost 70% of Americans believe in the resurrection. 10 years ago, it was almost 80%. So I don't like the trend, but it is what it is. And that tells me that most of you here, and, and you have a little bit of a bias sample, right, because you're in the church, most of you here probably do believe that Jesus rose from the dead in bodily form. But I guarantee some of you don't. And you don't believe in it because you just don't think miracles are possible. You can't calculate it. You can't put it on a calculator. can't do a science experiment. It just doesn't happen. And so I'm here to say that no matter which one describes you, you're fully convinced, you're somewhat convinced but unsure, or you're a skeptic, it doesn't matter which of the three today is going to help you. I'm going to give you some strong reasons to believe. I believe Jesus Christ really did rise on Easter and I say that with 100% confidence. And I say that because there's enough evidence surrounding the resurrection of Jesus Christ that any reasonable person, when presented with that evidence, would reach the same conclusion if they were objective, open, and honest. In a court of law, and I've been um, in many trials um, uh, uh, I've been summons, and then um, I didn't play the Christian card, so I actually got on the jury. So, um, you know, you don't, you know, like, I'm a Christian pastor, I believe in the Bible, you must be, you know, and everything. And then you get out of it, right, if you play that card. But then I didn't. I, so so I've, been, I've been in these rooms where we had to deliberate, you know, well, well, did that person hit that person intentionally? What responsibility? It was amazing. It wasn't even just right or wrong. It was what percentage? It's crazy. And you find somebody innocent or guilty, you weren't there, you don't, but you go based on the preponderance of evidence. And based on the preponderance of evidence, you declare innocence and guilt. In some cases, the preponderance of evidence is so strong, the jury deliberates for about five seconds, and then you declare innocent or guilty. And other times it takes, this is one of those where it wouldn't take any debate. There's enormous evidence for the bodily resurrection of Christ. And what do I mean by that? I mean, the body that was put in the tomb is the same body that rose again. Now, it had different characteristics because God glorified it. That's another miracle, but that's for another time. I just want to talk about his resurrection. And today I want to give you what I call the four E's, the four E's, the letter E, that validate Jesus' resurrection. There's a critical line of evidence that the four E's communicate. There are four points of evidence and they're all in your notes. And, and by the way, uh, a real helpful tool that helped me in preparation for this and uh, will help you if you're skeptical are two books by a man named Lee Strobel, formerly an atheist, became a Christian, and great man of God in ministry and everything. They're called The Case for Christ and The Case for Faith. The Case for Christ and The Case for Faith. And if you're already convinced in the resurrection of Christ, you're going to be more strong in your faith. 
And if you're unsure about it, I'm going to give you lots of food for thought. So, without any further ado, the first E that I think validates the resurrection of Christ is what I call the early accounts. And by that I mean that there are accounts that Jesus rose from the dead really, really early. The more close you come to an event, the more likely you are to describe it accurately. A skeptic might say, well, the resurrection is just a legend because Christ died in either A.D. 30 or A.D. 33, but he dates it a little differently, and he died either then. And the New Testament writers wrote many, 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 many years later, there's a huge time gap. Not true. Not true. The first four books of the New Testament chronicle the life of Jesus Christ, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Everybody debates on which is the priority. The consensus, the strong consensus is, is what's called the Matthean priority. That means that Matthew came first. Not only that, there's a strong consensus. Even liberals who, ha who hate the Bible, honestly, are forced to admit this, that Matthew is probably written in the mid to late 40s. So let's go A.D. 30. Let's go late 40s. Not even 20 years from the time of Jesus Christ, Matthew wrote accurately about the life of Christ, including his resurrection. But it gets even more incredible. Because not, not only were they within the lifetime of Jesus Christ, which would produce eyewitnesses who were still around, who wouldn't exaggerate, they, wouldn't, they would correct any problems, any errors, any myths, any erroneous legends. You have something even greater. The record of Christ's resurrection was within a couple years of his resurrection. And we see it in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 to 4. Now, 1 Corinthians 15 was written in the mid-50s. Well, Vince, that's 10 years later than Matthew. But what Paul quotes is fascinating. Let me read it to you first and explain. Paul says, the Apostle Paul says this, I passed unto you, Corinthian Christians, what I received, which is of the greatest importance, which tells you how important the resurrection is. That Christ died for our sins, as was written in the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised to life on the third day as written in the scriptures, in the scriptures, in the scriptures. See, so I'm not really necessarily focusing on the fact that it was predicted, because it certainly was, which is a great evidence for the resurrection. It was predicted, and it occurred. But it's this. The statement that Paul received and passed along, as he said, is a creed, a creed, a formal statement of faith. I grew up in a tradition where we would say the Apostles' Creed. I believe this, I believe that, I believe that. And you would say it every week. And that was just a tradition, it was a creed. But most scholars now have just come to realize that the creed that Paul quotes was written just two to three years after Christ rose from the dead. So it's really close proximity. What's the significance? Again, there was no time gap for a myth or a false legend to develop. In 1844, a, a famous historian said this. He says, I challenge any skeptical person, any historian, anywhere to produce just one example of a legend growing up that fast. Let's say even this creed wasn't two years after the resurrection. Let's say it's 20 years later that would grow up that fast and then distort reality. He's, he's throwing throw out the challenge to every historian, secular, anything. And it's never been shown. To this day, not one historian has produced an example of a legend rising up and maintaining itself so quickly after. In fact, some historians did some research. They went back to the first century, the time when Jesus Christ lived. They looked for it long and hard. They found, guess how long it took for legend to grow up and be in error. It took at least 80 years. But the record is clear. The Apostle Paul's Creed was developed within a year or two of the resurrection. Matthew, within 10 to 20 years of the resurrection. And in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says hundreds of people were eyewitnesses of Christ. More on that in just a minute. So when he said this, he's like, ask them. Talk to them. Talk to the people who are right there who saw it. They're still alive to ask questions. So the early accounts show that it's an accurate history of Jesus. The closer you are to the reality of something, the more likely you are to have credibility and accuracy in repeating it. The second E is 
the most obvious, although it's the most debated, and that's what we call the empty tomb. Now, this is interesting. During Jesus' trial, one of his main chief accusers was the high priest named Caiaphas. Did you know about, I don't know if it was at least 10 or 20 years ago, archaeologists found the tomb and body of Caiaphas. Isn't that interesting? They found the tomb and body of the one who was the chief religious accuser of Jesus, but they never found the body of Jesus. Interesting. And history tells how Jesus was laid in a prominent person's tomb. The Bible talks about this Pharisee, this man who was a secret Christian for a while. His name was Joseph of Arimathea. And uh, I'm I'm confusing him with um, Nicodemus. I don't don't remember if Joseph of Arimathea was a religious leader, so strike that from the record. But the tomb was then sealed. Elite guards placed by the Romans and insured by the Jewish leadership uh, on the site were secured. And yet, look at Matthew 18, or 28, 5 to 6. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you're looking for Jesus. They went to the tomb to take care of the tomb, take care of the body, how they would get in, they didn't know, and they found it open. And these angels are, he's not here. I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen just as he said. Now, I want to say a few facts about this. If you're going to purport a myth, you wouldn't have done a number of things in this passage. Number one, one fact, it may seem minor to you, but it's not. It's of major significance, and that's this. It was women who first discovered the empty tomb. Why is that significant? Because in those days, the testimony of a woman was considered worthless. It's hard to believe, but true. Women were not allowed to testify in a court of law. Women were not credibly assigned um, weight to their testimony or their words. So the writers of the New Testament say, well, the first people to discover Jesus Christ were women. Well, if you want to win people over in that day, that was a bad thing to start off with. It didn't matter, though. It didn't matter because it was accurate, because it was true. It didn't matter whether it undermined their case. Their goal was to report truth. So why would they say that if it wasn't true? And if that wasn't true, why would they then say that the, the body was not there if it really was or was taken away? But they reported it accurately because they were committed to accuracy. And here's the second point. Everybody admitted the tomb was empty. Everybody, everybody admitted the tomb was empty. The people against Christ, the Jewish leaders, the Roman leaders, the haters of Jesus, the believers who are confused of Jesus, they, every single group admitted the tomb was empty. Opponents tried to bribe guards into saying that they had fallen asleep while the disciples' bodies were stolen. Well, that's interesting. Well, how'd they know if they were asleep? <laughs> we were asleep when it happened. Well, how do you know? How do you know when you're asleep? It doesn't make any sense. But when the disciples declared the tomb was empty, what did people say? The disciples said the tomb was empty. Did people say, you're wrong? No. Did they say, you got the wrong tomb? No. Did they say, well, you're right, uh, the tomb is empty? Yes, they did. The only question was, how did it get empty? That's the only question on the table. Now, consider the list of suspects about the Roman authorities. Maybe they took it. Well, no. Hey, why did Jesus dead? How about the Jewish leaders? No. They wanted Jesus to stay dead. Well, what about the disciples? They took it. Yeah, they want. They had nothing to gain. What did they have to gain by taking the body? They had everything to lose by stealing the body. Everything. Why lie about Jesus' body and suffer for a known to them lie. Why would they suffer 
for a lie. It cost them their lives. Well, the best explanation is the empty tomb was empty because Jesus did, in fact, rise from the dead, providing the second E proof. And this is especially true when you consider the third E, and that's this, the eyewitness testimony. When Jesus rose from the dead, he did, you know, just so you know, it, it wasn't like, oh, uh, he's not here, he is risen, where is he? He's gone, he's up in heaven, nobody's ever, it, that's not what happened. Jesus appeared to people after his resurrection and they actually saw him, actually touched him, actually talked with him, actually ate with him, and the like. There were over, uh, there were 12 appearances recorded in scripture over a 40 day period and he was observed by at least, at least 515 people, women and men, individuals and groups, indoors and outdoors, believers and skeptics, hard-hearted people, tender-hearted ones. And look at 1 Corinthians 15, 4 to 8. Look at what it says. He was buried that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures and that he appeared to Peter. Then to the 12. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of his brothers, of the brothers, at the same time, most of whom are still living. So at the time Paul wrote 1 Corinthians around the mid-50s uh, AD, they're still alive. Go ask them. Then he appeared to James, then all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also. He appeared to Paul later. Paul was on his way to murder some Christians. He rejected the resurrection, rejected Jesus, hated everything about Jesus, wanted to defend Old Testament Judaism blindly. And on his way to kill some Christians, he was blinded by the light. Not the, is that man for a man song? Not that song, you know, no, do, 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 none of that. He was just blinded by the light and he saw Jesus Christ. I mean, one of the most amazing questions, he, he falls down, he's blinded by the light. And here's what Paul says, um, um, is that you, Lord? <laughs> what else would it be? So he saw Jesus too. Can you imagine a trial with 515 witnesses? Yes, Your Honor, we have 515 witnesses. If you invited each one to the court and each one spoke for 15 minutes each, it'd be 128 hours of testimony. We'd be here till Friday. And after listening to that testimony of 515 people saying the same thing, you think people would go, nah, I'm not buying it. No, I don't agree with you. Don't agree with you, 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 you. Crazy. Some say, well, it was a hallucination. You know, they meant well, but they hallucinated. They, saw, they thought they saw Jesus. It's interesting, hallucination experts, yep, there are hallucination experts. <laughs> they tell us that's not possible. A hallucination is an individual event. It's like a dream. Like, you wouldn't have a dream and get up, like, I wouldn't get up and go, man, wasn't that dream I had last night amazing? And you'd be, you'd be like, I don't know, what to, you're a weirdo. Just stay away from me. Like, no, because you have dreams individually, you have hallucinations individually. It would be a greater miracle to have 515 people have the exact same hallucination than the resurrection from the dead. Here's another one. Groupthink. I'll tell you right now. I will tell you right. Groupthink is real. I've seen it. I have seen it. It is real. So this is that some group suggestion caused the group of the disciples, the 515, to believe the idea of the resurrection, even though it's not true. <clears throat> Dr. Gary Collins, who was a um, Christian psychiatrist, said this. It is not possible because the conditions for groupthink were not present. And he lists four of them. The disciples were not anticipating a resurrection. It was completely contrary to their beliefs. Second, Jesus ate and talked with them. Third, he appeared at different times. It wasn't like, wow, is that really Jesus? And then lastly, the body was never found. Again, it goes back to the empty tomb, the second he. So the eyewitness testimony is the third. There's one more, one last E. And this is really kind of the outgrowth 
of the first three E's. And that's this, the emergence of the church. The fact that Lakeshore Community Church, the fact that one and a half billion people plus will be in church this weekend. The emergence of the church. Consider the disciples right after the resurrection, right after the resurrection happens on Sunday morning, they're despondent, they're dejected, they're depressed, they hid, they fled. The Bible says they locked the door. When anybody knocked on the door, they wanted to make sure they weren't going to get arrested. Peter denied Jesus Christ three times. Their leader, Jesus Christ, was put to death in the most degrading way possible. And they thought, it is over. They didn't understand the resurrection. Jesus tried to give them little hints of it, glimmers of it, statements about it. They didn't understand it. But after history, after Easter, history tells us these same people boldly proclaimed the resurrection. About seven weeks after the resurrection on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, verses 14 to 32, Peter stands up and gives a sermon, and part of it he says this. Peter stood up, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all eyewitnesses to the fact, which we talked about earlier. There's such a boldness. in all the 12 disciples, 11 of them, Judas hung himself, but then even the, the, the 12th, Matthias, who was an eyewitness of Christ, such a boldness. <clears throat> that they went from locking the door, cowardice, fear. What are they going to do? 11 of the 12 of them died a martyr's death. They died for their faith. And I'll tell you this. If I believed a lie and somebody said, admit that's a lie or you're going to die, I-, I would stop lying. I would admit it's a lie. But they didn't because it was the truth. Peter was crucified upside down. We don't know this, the Bible doesn't say this, but history tells us his last request was that he not die the way Jesus Christ did. So they crucified him upside down. Pretty much the last thing a liar is thinking about. And the only one that didn't die a martyr's death was John, who wrote the Gospel of John, who wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John later, and then wrote the book of Revelation, which we're studying at midweek. They tried to kill, they threw him in a pot of boiling oil and he lived. How about that? I would think I'd be confessing lies pretty quickly right there. Well, guess what? They didn't have to because it wasn't a lie. People will occasionally die for a religious belief if they sincerely believe it's true. I mean, there are terrorists that blow themselves up. And they think they're going to go to heaven and be with virgins. Well, they're going to go to hell and going to be with whores, to be honest with you. The exact opposite, not to be so crass. But they believe that. Oh, well, maybe they just believe that. But watch this. Even though terrorists are wrong, I'm going to slip on this pick. Even though terrorists are wrong, they sincerely believe that. Why would they believe a lie? And be killed. The disciples were in a unique position to know for a fact if the resurrection of Christ were true or not. They validated and reported early accounts. They confirmed and saw the empty tomb. They talked with eight and touched Jesus' as an eyewitness. They so knew it to be true, they were willing to give up their life for it. You see the difference? Rather than somebody who, a crazy person who who blows up people or kills himself or whatever for some cause that he believes, well, he believes it, but it's wrong. The disciples believed it, and it's proved right. One person said this, no one knowingly and willingly dies for a lie. You stack these E's up and put them all together, and here's what you get. There is more irrefutable evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ than virtually any other event in history. More event for the resurrection, more uh, evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ than there is that the pilgrims came here and founded America, or that George Washington was our first elected president. Well, none of you doubt that. 
You don't doubt that, Jesus, uh, that uh, George Washington was our first elected president. You don't doubt that. Do you doubt that the pilgrims came here to help found our country? You don't doubt that either. But why do people doubt the resurrection of Christ? Oh, because then they have to be accountable. See, then they have to answer to God. And then they have to change how they live. Oh, well, now, now, now there's a lot of evidence to believe why people don't believe in the resurrection. Because it'll cost you something. The most successful lawyer in history, you know who it was? A man named Sir Lionel Lucku, L-U-C-K-H-O-O. Strange name. If you go to the Guinness World Book of Records under the most successful lawyer, the name Sir Lionel Luck who will be there. As a defense attorney, he won 245 murder trials in a row, either before a jury or on appeal. He died in 1997 at the age of 83 after a very distinguished career. What kind of skill do you have to be that good as a lawyer? Tremendous analytical powers. So that when a prosecutor presents what appears to be an airtight case against his client, he finds flaws in that case. He knew what constitutes reliable and convincing evidence. All this was true of Sir Lionel Luck, who, by the way, was twice knighted by Queen Elizabeth. Wouldn't it be great if you got Sir Lionel Luck, who, to look into this and see if it was true? Well, guess what? He did. He did. He took his legal powers of analysis, applied them to the resurrection of Christ. He spent years studying the historical record. Here's a brief statement of his conclusion. I say unequivocally that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is so overwhelming that it compels acceptance by proof, which leaves absolutely no room for doubt. We know the dead don't come back to life. But here's a man that studied the record, applied the legal test of evidence, and came to the conclusion, conclusion that yes, in this case, he did. To me, everything's a matter of faith. Oh, I'm, a, I'm not a person of faith. Yeah, you are. Did you, when you came in the auditorium, did you check the chair to see if it would hold you up? You, did, you didn't. You had faith. What did you have? You had informed faith because you've sat in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of chairs and it held you up. But you still had faith. And that's what Christianity is. That's what the resurrection is. An informed faith that Jesus did rise from the dead. But why did Jesus rise on Easter? What, what was it all about? Well, there are a lot of reasons. Let me give you the heart of it right here in your notes. Jesus rose to prove, number one, that he's God. And number two, to provide hope for our own resurrection. Christ's resurrection was the essential first step to pave the way for every single future resurrection. He had to be first. He's God to lead the way. Romans 1.4 says this. He, Jesus Christ, was declared to be the Son of God, God, in power according to the Spirit of holiness. How? By the resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ our Lord. He was declared God by the resurrection from that. The resurrection proves that Jesus is God. But what about our own resurrection? 1 Corinthians 15, 17 and 20 says this, If Christ did not rise, your faith is futile and your sins have never been forgiven. This is how essential the resurrection is to Easter. Find the body of Jesus Christ and this whole gig is over. I'm not even getting a two-week notice. It's over for all of us in the church. That's what Paul says. The resurrection is essential. But Christ, he goes on, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. Now watch this. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, not soul sleep, not some weird doctrine. And you, it's a, fall, soul, uh, to fall asleep is a euphemism for death. And if I slip on this pick, I'm going to die. And, and what does he mean by the first fruits? Well, the first fruits in, in the Jewish agricultural culture were the very first produce of a harvest. 
you always give God, if you love him, if you don't, all bets are off. If you love him, you always give God the first of everything and the best of everything. You give God the first and best of your time, the first and best of your talent, the first and best of your treasure. That's called the first fruits. So the very first, the very best harvest is Jesus Christ's resurrection. But it also indicates if Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection, what does that tell you? There's more fruits that are to come, that are to follow. Christian scholar Gary Hevermas put it this way, said every bit of evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ is evidence for every true Christian's resurrection. I'm going to go a step further. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is evidence for every true human being's resurrection. Every, and this is a big myth. People go, well, if you're a Christian, you'll be resurrected. No, if you're a human being, you'll be resurrected. Every human is going to be resurrected. Your body's going to rise. You go, well, I was cremated. I was sprinkled over Lake Ontario. Good luck with that. God can do it. He can do it. Well, this guy was planted under a tree 200 years ago. God will do it. He'll figure it out. And everybody, look at, look at what Acts 24, 15 says. There will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. The righteous, Christians, and the wicked, non-Christians. They're both going to be resurrected. Now, how many know they're not going to the same place? And I think you could use a pretty easy imagination that if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you'll be resurrected to eternal life. And I don't say this with any glee. I say this with sadness. And I say this to say this is why we started Lakeshore Community Church. Because if you don't believe in Christ, if you haven't accepted him as your Lord and Savior, if you haven't received the gospel, you'll be resurrected to hell forever. And both are eternal. It's an amazing, amazing truth. So the ultimate question for all of us is this. Are you ready for your resurrection? In other words, you're going to be resurrected because Christ was resurrected. The only question is, which camp are you going to be resurrected in? Because of when we live now, are you going to be resurrected at the rapture? Or maybe during the tribulation or after the end of the tribulation as a Christian? Or will you be resurrected later at the end and sit at the great white throne judgment when everybody resurrected there are doomed? You can know without a doubt. You can be 100% sure that you're part of the resurrection of the righteous. How do you do that? How do you make sure you're a part of the right resurrection? How many want to know? How many want dinner? I mean, I'm just curious. <laughs> I, know, I know it's Saturday night, maybe not as big as, you know, and all that. Most, two most important things you've ever considered in your life. Here you go. How do you make sure you're part of the resurrection of the righteous and not the unrighteous? Please hear me, because I hate to say it, but it's true. So many people walk out of here, and they can't tell you what I just said, especially this part. Oh, well, you know, I'm a good person. It, the last, that's the last answer you want to give Jesus on judgment day. I'm a good person because it's not true. As wonderful as you might be compared to others. Here's the first. Believe that Jesus is your one and only hope. Your one and only hope for what? For forgiveness of sin. The biggest problem is we don't like to admit our sin. I don't. You don't. But unless you admit your sin to Jesus Christ, you're going to be like two brothers. These two brothers um, were rich. They were wicked. And this may be a true story. I'm not, I can't confirm it. They both live wild, dark, sinful lives, and they use their money to cover up the dark side of their lives. On the surface, though, you wouldn't have known. They went to church every week, and um, they just used all their money to, to cover up every Sunday. They gave lots of money to the church because they had so much money. 
So the church calls a new pastor. The new pastor loves the Bible, loves God. He preaches the truth. <coughs> He's zealous about it, courageous about it. So the church grows and grows and grows. It gets so big, they have to build a new auditorium. And so he's a man of keen insight, man of integrity, and he saw what these two brothers were really all about. Well, one of the brothers dies. He passes away, and the young pastor is asked to preach his funeral. And the day before that funeral... The surviving brother of the two wicked brothers pulls the pastor aside, gives him an envelope. He goes, Pastor, in this envelope is all the money you need to build our new auditorium. I ask one favor. At the funeral, I want you to say my brother was a saint. Pastor said, agreed. Took the check cashed it that day next day comes the funeral young pastor has courage conviction man of integrity so here's what he says he says the man lying here before us was an ungodly sinner wicked to the core unfaithful to his wife hot tempered with his children ruthless in his business and a total hypocrite in the church but compared to his brother he was a saint And we're all, <laughs> thought is there a little better than just a little. <laughs> but here's what I want to say. We all are trying to justify ourselves. And there's no need to. Look at Ephesians 1, 7. By the death of Christ, that was Good Friday, we are set free. That is, our sins are forgiven. All thanks to Christ's death. Christ offers forgiveness of your sins, but your sins are not forgiven until you acknowledge you need forgiveness. And to acknowledge you need forgiveness, you must acknowledge you are a sinner, not a pretty good person, not a, I'm not that bad, I'm not as bad as Hitler, not as bad as this one, I'm not as bad as, as uh, that one. Or what. It, no, that you're a sinner and that you need forgiveness. The only forgiveness available is Jesus Christ, and you acknowledge that. But you not only believe that, look at, oh, I, I forgot one other verse. John eleven twenty five 25 says, not only did his death on the cross pay for it, so did his resurrection. John eleven twenty five, 25, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. You have to believe in Jesus Christ. Are you desperate enough for the forgiveness of Christ that you will believe in him? You have to be. I was so desperate to have my sins forgiven in the fall of 1983, so sick of my sins, so sick of all the nonsense I was doing, all the garbage I was doing, sick of it, sick, sick, sick of it, until someone shared with me the believe and then the next point, receive gospel. I had been taught, be a good person, be a good person, be a good person. My religious leader told me, oh, don't worry, you're going to heaven. That was the same time I was making drug deals in the foyer of the church, and I'm going to heaven. The religious leader flat out lied to me. And I threw myself on the mercy of God, and I said, Jesus Christ, I don't know what to do with my life. <laughs> I believe in you. Are you, willing to do, are you willing to just give up everything? The Bible says if you want to live in Christ, you've got to die to your sin. And you just throw him, fling him on the mercy of Jesus and he will forgive you. And then the second thing is you not only believe, but you do the second thing. You receive the free gift of eternal life from Jesus. Most people believe eternal life is something you can earn. Something you do. I came to church that goes in my account. I get a little credit in my account for that. So it's religious events, moral goodness, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm going to go to heaven because I'm a good person, and I just have one probing question. If you're going to go to heaven because you're a good person, why did Jesus Christ suffer on the cross? Why? <laughs> because you're not good enough. 
By the way, if you're a good person, my question is, how good is good enough? Well, um, if I'm here, good enough is like here. And that's pretty much the answer, right? Well, here, let me tell you what good enough is. Perfect. So if you haven't sinned, congratulations. You don't need to be here tonight. But we all have. Look at Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. It says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of works, not a result of doing something, trying something, acting a certain way, going a certain place, having something put on you, saying something, this. No. It's not about your works. It's about the work of Jesus Christ already done. It's not about what you do. It's been about what's already been done by Jesus Christ. It's a lie. It's a lie to say you're a good person. You have to believe in your head and receive in your heart. Have you ever accepted the free gift of the gospel? I'll pray with you in just a moment if you haven't. And let me say this. Howard Hendricks, my fair professor in graduate school, he wrote this in his Bible shortly after he became a Christian, and it applies here. You ready? When I try, I fail. But when I trust, he succeeds. When I try, I fail. When I trust, he succeeds. Succeeds in forgiving me and giving me new life. Because the Christian life isn't difficult. (laughs) It's impossible. But when you trust, you can succeed. The resurrection is a big help. And I hope it will help you find eternal life or be strong in your eternal life. Let's all bow our heads and pray. At some point, I could give you evidence and evidence and others can give you more evidence. You have to decide Do you believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ? If you don't, I hope you will. You say, Vince, it's a matter of faith. Everything's a matter of faith. Will you trust Jesus Christ? Don't keep trying. You'll fail. Start trusting. You'll succeed. Say, Jesus Christ, you are God. You are holy. I am a sinner. You died on the cross. You rose from the dead. I now believe it. And I not only believe it, I receive you into my life by faith. And if you receive him into your life by faith and faith alone, this is the greatest moment in your life. Because the old you is gone. The new you has arrived. The forgiven you has arrived. And you're going to be part of the good resurrection the resurrection of the righteous when that day comes and not the resurrection of the unrighteous. Father, I pray that people online, people here tonight will receive you as their Lord and Savior. And those of us who already have will be more confident in the resurrection and more bold in how we live for the resurrected one. Pray that all these people have a fantastic Easter. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, everybody. Hope you have a great Easter. Love you guys. What a great message to end this series on Easter weekend as we learn who the real Jesus is. Now, do me a favor. If you prayed that prayer with Pastor Vince just a moment ago, we want to be the first to congratulate you and to welcome you to the Christian family. And also, please let us know about it. Reach out because we would love to help you and get some critical next steps and information into your hands. And maybe you didn't pray that prayer today, but have something in your heart that you feel like you just need to talk to someone about. Well, in that same app that we talked about earlier, click the connect button at the bottom and let us know. And you can also go to lcc.info. And thanks again for joining us today. Make sure you tune in or better yet, come in person next week as we start a brand new series called Parenting Isn't for Cowards. I know I can always use new tips to grow as a parent, so I am looking forward to this new series. Thanks again for being here and we'll see you next time. Have a great rest of your week.